So welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today we're going to talk about fear, uh, everything connected to the subject of fear, um, and how it relates to the news, uh, the media, and other topics. We've talked about ISIS before, for example, and how you're more likely to die from tripping over household furniture from being beheaded by ISIS. But um, we live in this culture of fear now. Everybody's exploiting the fear factor. The media get more listeners when they play on sensationalizing a story. As a result, people are often afraid of the wrong things. Uh, there's often out of proportion reaction. You know, fear of immigrants, xenophobia, fear of cancer, constant articles about how everything causes cancer. The latest one apparently is sausages and bacon. Um, my advice, uh, ignore it all. I, I think we're being lied to about the real causes of cancer, for example, and uh, the real reasons have just not been investigated. Um, the government manipulate the public. Uh, for the, an example is the uh, fairly recent Scotland independence vote. Fear was used by our great leader Cam Un again um, to try to scare people into voting a particular way. The public can even be led into war. Uh, example, our current war on terror, never ending war. Al Qaeda are out of fashion. ISIS is the new thing to fear. So I wanted to talk today to Anthony Kay and uh, also to Jeff Wise, who joined us recently on MH370 episode. First of all, let's go over to Anthony. We're going to talk to Anthony, our resident researcher. Uh, formerly, he was in the shadow of the Erges volcano near Cappadocia in Turkey. Now, I believe, uh, Anthony, you're near the highest ice rink in the world at the foot of the Himalayas in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Nice of you to join us again. That's right. That's good to be here, Scott. Uh, yeah, you're right. I'm, I, moved, uh, I moved to Kazakhstan again. It's my third time here. And uh, yeah, so now I've, I've, swapped the, I've swapped the volcano for the Zaliski Alatal mountain range, which is sort of the, the last tailing off of the Himalayas. It's a beautiful place. The last volcano was pretty spectacular, <laughs> but these are good too, these mountains. Yeah, they are. I worked there also, as you know, and uh, I remember cycling to work, uh, just looking at that view. Um, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's an incredible view. You um, uh, asked me if I could have a look into the the subject of fear, which is a rather huge topic. <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, I guess uh, you know it is definitely. I guess a good place to start would be you know what is fear and 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 why do we have it? You know, is is there any purpose to it, or is it just something which holds us back? You know, um, obviously lots of people have have uh, tried to work this out. And uh, one simple definition I like is from uh, Professor Abigail Marsh of the University of Georgetown in the USA. She says, uh, fear is the expectation or anticipation of possible harm. Right? And, and she goes on to say that uh, our bodies are highly sensitive to the possibility of threat. So they can interpret signals that a, th that a threat might be near. And that's kind of an important point. Uh, you, don't, you don't often have to see the actual threat itself. You only need to see something which indicates there might be a threat and your body reacts. And that's, that's really important for some of the stuff we're going to discuss later, like manipulation. But look, when you, um, when you perceive a threat or a threat signal, um, electrical activity occurs in certain areas of your brain, most notably your uh, amygdala. And that set, sends out neurotransmitters that, that create various responses. Um, things like, you know, you freeze or you jump. Uh, and then the freezing in particular has a, a strong evolutionary purpose because when you freeze, you, you can then, first of all, not be so obvious to predators, but also uh, scan the landscape and decide whether or not you need to go to the next stage of fear, which is the fight or flight reflex. Right? Now, all of those things have, um, have uh, given us a number of tools to help us deal with threats, right? But if your amygdala doesn't work, then none of that happens and you just don't get a fear response. Uh, it is a bit of a pity that um, at your, your greatest hour of need when you're at, in a terrifying situation, your brain decides to shut down and, and sort of step away from the, um, the more complicated aspect of thinking. It does and it doesn't. Um, that that freezing doesn't last for very long, and actually that's pro, that's um that's regulated through an area of what uh, neuroscientists call the ancient brain, which are sort of the, the the oldest parts of the brain, and they're very much hardwired and difficult to control. So the freezing or the jumping, very difficult to control. But the later fight or flight response, it does allow us 
uh, at least a little time to to size up the situation and decide what to do. And so if you're going to manipulate someone's fear, that's the point where you need to step in and influence that 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 mental process of fight or flight. The the third option, uh, by the way, is that um, your uh, your amygdala decides. Sorry, your hypothalamus, another module of the brain, decides. No, actually, the threat's not so bad. Sends that message back to the amygdala, and the amygdala goes, "All right, everyone, emergency's off," and and sets another process in motion, which calms you down back to your normal level. Why do they always think of long words for these uh, long names for these things like uh, amygdala and <laughs> hypothalamus? <laughs> I, I don't know. I guess you know, cat and goat and snake were all taken. <laughs> but um, there are people in the world. I think that this is really interesting to me. Uh, who who don't have a working amygdala, and and those people are literally fearless. Uh, but when you observe them, you can you can see the benefits of fear. Uh, the most the most famous case is a woman called S M. Uh, not her real name for reasons of anonymity. She had a rare neurological condition which completely destroyed her amygdala. But the rest of her brain's fine. She lives a more or less normal life, except that neuroscientists kept keep coming around to her house and wanting to study her. She might, <laughs> so, she might be glad of the company. Well, she might be, yeah. And, but, and, but, and some of the, you know, by studying here, what I mean is they, they keep doing things like, you know, handing her live snakes and taking her through haunted houses and things like this. What, horrible people. Um, <laughs> yeah, neuroscientists are a cruel bunch. <laughs> but uh, but for me, the mo the most interesting thing about her is that that she li she lives or maybe lived. This is uh, going back a couple of years. She lives or lived next to a vacant lot, right? And she walks through that on the way home from work. And a few years back, she got mud on the vacant lot. Now, a normal person would would see that that location then as a signal of potential threat so their amygdala would would tell them to walk around right but she walks through the same lot every night uh, her amygdala, amygdala just doesn't tell her not to because it's broken so so she just she just does it so even when the threat has actually been realized and something bad has happened to her she can't process it to to tell her Okay, that's a that's a dangerous situation. Avoid that, right? Mm. So, so I, I think there we can really see how you know fear can be a positive thing. It can help us in in some very practical ways. I hope those um, neuroscientists don't buy her a ticket to Iraq or something like that as as part of their investigation. <laughs> I hope I hope not as well. <laughs> but I mean, you know that that whole process that we've just talked about, um, it can of course be used and, and misused in a number of ways. Uh, to persuade people to, you know, think or act uh, in in different fashions, and and one of the best places to look for that is, of course, you know, in the advertising and public relations industries. Um, there's actually there's a brilliant documentary about this by one of my favourite filmmakers, Adam Curtis. It's called uh, The Century of the Self, and he talks about how the public relations industry was born and how it developed. And quite surprisingly, you can trace it back to the ideas of just a very few people, in particular a guy called Edward Bernays, who was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And this guy had an incredible influence on the, on the century that, that, that followed. Um, his, his main idea was um, to persuade people that they wanted things which weren't in any way necessary to their lives. So, you know, of course, there's always been a desire for luxury and comfort, but, but pre-public relations and pre-marketing, people most mostly strived to get things that they needed, right? And industry was set up to give them those things. But then uh, marketing and PR came along using the techniques of psychology. And the world was, was I think we, we could say, transformed into, into what it is now. So now it's a place where, you know, people's personal identity and their aspirations partly revolve around the stuff they have, right? And, and industry has adapted to that. You know, now we have this world where you know, Bangladeshi kids are producing like Simpsons dolls in sweatshops that are huge fire risks, you know, and every so often one of them burns down and hundreds of those kids die so that other people can have things that they absolutely don't need. Um, <laughs> I mean, not, not to overstate the, the, the situation, you know, obviously the world is in many, many ways better off than it was 100 years ago. But still, I mean, it is a reality that, that we Western people in particular We've been sold all of these needs, and it's it's changed us, and we've exported that change to large parts of the developing world as well. Um, you know, there there is a formula in the advertising world: create the problem, then supply the solution. 
Uh, and there are several uh, well-known early examples of that. One is underarm hair. So, so nobody ever had a problem with underarm hair until some evil genius in the advertising industry started telling women that it was unsightly and things like this. So, so they created this problem and then they solved it with razors. Then they started on body odor. Like nobody thought it was bad before that their, you know, their arms had a funny smell, their armpits. No, no, it wasn't a problem, right? So they, so again, body odor was a problem completely invented by advertising executives. They created it, then they solved it with deodorants. I don't know, and actually. The, I, I think the, I, might, I might want to thank them for that, though. Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it is a difficult one because some of these problems, you know, we're so socialized to them now that, that yeah, it does seem it does seem like, well, of course it's a problem. You know? But, but the, still, the fact is 100 years ago it wasn't, and then an advertising executive had this idea. Right. Maybe they were just good liars um, uh, 100 years ago. They, people came in really smelling badly, and, and other people said, do you, do you have a problem? And they were like, um, no, of course not. But secretly they were like, oh, my goodness, I, I don't like spending a lot of time around him. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Though I think, um, I mean, there's a difference between somebody who, you know, like has to, has has um, been sweaty during the day but has had a good thorough shower in the morning mm. and someone who just is generally poor on hygiene. You know? <laughs> um, but are you telling me that David uh, Icke didn't come up with the phrase problem reaction solution then? No, definitely not. Okay, definitely I need not. to have a word with um, David about that. But, but he, he is right absolutely about that. Um, and, and fear has always been a very big part of it. You know, advertisers admit this. They know it. Um, so, so if you want to market um, a product... I was going to say not just advertisers, Sorry. but also um, insurance companies. I mean, they're one of the oh, biggest yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. fear mongers around because their whole industry relies on it, really. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, T totally. It's another industry built on on fear. Uh, but if you want to market a product to teenagers, you use the fear of not being accepted, for example. Yeah? If you want to market to housewives who are marketed to a lot because they're what's called the primary grocery buyers in most households, then you play on their fear of not being a good mum, right? So, for example, you, you can tell them that they need to provide a balanced lunchbox for their kids to take to school. And, and so you make an advertisement, you put a believable busy mum character in, in the advertisement, and she says, you know, as a busy mum, I find it difficult to provide my kids with a balanced diet they need to grow up healthy. And this is full of cues that are making the viewer think, like, yeah, I'm busy too, I'm a mum too, my kids need stuff to grow up healthy. So, you know, am I neglecting them? And then your believable busy mum holds up a product and says, that's why I was so glad when I found this product, right? Mm -hmm. And the product is actually, you know, like a chemically loaded sugar bomb with pictures of oats on the packaging to make, make you think it's actually healthy. <laughs> and so you've got these mums in their millions, you know, buying these things out of the fear that they've somehow failed their children if they don't do what the advertiser tells them. That's pretty uh, uh, pretty cruel thing to do, isn't it? By the advertiser. It is, it is. And especially... Yeah, definitely, and especially when the products don't actually provide the benefits that they're advertising. What shocks me um, um, is how people still fall for it, though. Like, uh, you know, every, most people know these people are actors on TV who are pretending to be, you know, caring mothers. They're just actors, aren't they? Yeah, of course. But you know, now you've got um, you've got neuromarketing as well. So a lot of uh, you know focus groups have been with us for a long time. But but in the last few years, it's become fashionable to. Uh, to monitor brain activity during focus groups. And so you can measure things like believability and likability and things like, and other abilities that, you know, are made up words. Um, uh, so you can cast somebody in an ad, get a focus group together, do the neuromarketing research on, on, on the ad and find out how believable that person is. And if people go, nah, I didn't really buy that actress, just put another actress in the same place. So actually, we um, could say the the focus groups are an evil part of society because they're helping um, sustain this kind of advertising. Well, I mean, you know, your advertising executives, or some of them at least, would argue, look, we're just trying to market to you. You know, <laughs> we're trying to like narrow it down and find what 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 you find inspiring, so we can market to you. But uh, yeah, I mean, the other side of it is, I'm sorry, but you're poking our brains now to find out how to better deceive us. You know, um, I, I really don't, I, I don't, I don't like the way they use children in adverts to sort of say, oh look, this, look at this cute little child. Now buy this product. Yeah, you know, I hate yeah, when yeah. they do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and you know, there are many other things as well. There's kids. There's there's uh, there's pets. If you're going to advertise some, um, you know, toilet paper, for example, you get a fluffy dog, right? Because it has the 
it has the the um, psychological associations of like softness and uh, and things like this. And also probably because you know most dog owners have had to deal with their dog's business as well. So there's a kind of mental connection there. So it's all it, it's all operating on this this level of psychology on various layers. Some obvious, some a little deeper. You know. Just a quick advert break. Our email is scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. Check out our past episodes. We've got lots of interesting guests and you can find us on YouTube on two channels. We talk about conspiracies, mysteries, injustices, corruption, religion, war, peace. You can leave your own message and we can base our show around what you think. That's what we intend to do. Help us find the truth in the news. Find our YouTube channels, we've got all the episodes on there, Truth Sentinel and Truth Sentinel 1. Subscribe to both so you get notified of everything. Click on the About section, you'll find all the links. Have you got something you'd like to advertise? If it's truth related, honest and ethical, get in contact. You can help us, we can help you. We sell our own t-shirts with the greatest enemy of truth is blind belief in authority on the back. Just $20 um, plus postage and packing. Let us know your size, just send us an email, we can sort it out. We've also teamed up with truthtshirts.com and um, they make political t-shirts. Let people know where you stand basically. Use the code TRUTH1, you get a 10% discount and we get a donation. They make all kinds of political t-shirts and they can customise them for you as well. If you've got any ideas for publicity stunts, get in contact. We need to escalate this channel, make it much bigger. We need your help. Please support us. Thank you. But uh, anyway, for every, everything I've, I've just said about fear as a marketing tool, the research is, is pretty extensive and it all confirms, uh, it all confirms this. Yeah, and I, wa I wanted to mention just one recent study uh, about product placement, which found that uh, pr product placement works best when people are scared. So, so getting your can of beer into a you know scary scene in a horror movie is better than getting it into say a rom com or an action flick. Uh, the researchers uh, in the study got people to watch different kinds of movies, sometimes in a group and sometimes alone, and all the movies had commercial products placed in them. And then afterwards, the viewers were interviewed about their feelings towards the brands, right? And and they found that uh, people who watched horror movies alone felt a surprisingly strong feeling of attachment towards the brands, which I think is a little disturbing. Mm. <laughs> um, and from that, the researchers reached a kind of tentative conclusion that, that when you watch a horror movie with another person, you kind of cling on to them to help you through the scary experience. You know, they, the scientists call it a need for affiliation during fear, right? But if, if there's no other person around, then, then pretty much any Anything else can be a substitute, especially something familiar. So it could be, you know, a, bl a blanket, or or it could literally be a bag of, of potato chips. <laughs> mm. And in fact, um, the the research suggested that people felt like the brand itself had gone through the scary experience with them, and that had. So so if you scare someone while they're looking at your brand, that can improve their relationship with the brand. <laughs> um, it doesn't always work in um, in real relationships, by the way. I once went on a date with a, a girl to see a. Uh, um, a very horrific movie, and uh, she never spoke to me again after that. So it doesn't always work. <laughs> um, we'll come back to that later, actually, about um, um, different people's uh, responses to horror films. Mm -hmm. um, but if we go back to the original purpose of fear, uh, you know, to protect us from possible threats, priming our bodies to respond in certain ways, and then we compare it to, th to this situation, we can see that the same instinct can either help us or be used to control us. And, and as you said, it's not only advertisers who do that, it's, it's governments too. Yeah. It really um, is, yeah. It, it is, and, and insurance companies and many others. Um, the documentary maker who I mentioned earlier, Adam Curtis, he, he's explored that topic rather brilliantly. And his argument is that uh, in recent years, uh, creating fear among the population has become a much larger factor in shaping government policy than it used to be. Uh, he says that uh, in the 20th century we had ideologies, right, and, and political leaders could use those to inspire people and promise a better future. So, so in particular, you had you had communism and capitalism, both kind of striving towards the betterment of humankind, you know, and they were perfect vehicles for an ambitious leader to try and get the support of his or her people. But now, 
those ideologies are essentially dead. And so Curtis says, the politicians don't talk about dreams anymore. Instead, they talk about nightmares, and then they promise to save us from those nightmares. And, and, um, and the example he uses... Sorry, mm -hmm. I was going to say, uh, Kim, uh, Cam Mo Un does this all the time. Um, he was recently mm -hmm. in an interview uh, discussing um, an execution of um, a young guy in uh, Saudi Arabia, and he was asked why he was continuing to support the Saudi government um, in some kind of scheme. Yep. And he said, well, they provide mm -hmm. us with a lot of uh, security information to keep us safe. So he, he does that all the time. Like, it's one thing I find very, mm. very annoying about him. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you can you can see it in the political discourse of of, of many leaders, and and yeah, you're, you're right. Cameroon is is a is a particularly um, he's one of the worst offenders, and in but in fact, I I would say part of the the art of governing is to know which buttons to press when you want to scare the population. Yeah, so uh, don't press the big red one that says nuclear uh, detonation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try to avoid that one. <laughs> but in most English-speaking countries, the terrorism button is one of the big ones. Yeah. Uh, but believe it or not, I mean, the rest of the world is not obsessed with terrorism. And and even if you you travel from Australia to New Zealand and then go back, which I've done, uh, you notice a huge difference, and it becomes clear how how much Australians are ruled by this paranoia about terror. Because in New Zealand, it's just not on the radar at all, and they're. You know, they're, they're in many ways similar societies, but one has this and the other doesn't. But uh, other cultures also have their own their own buttons. For example, um, if in Ukraine, if you want the population to get behind you for some reason, you can push the health scare button. And and you and I, as you remember, <laughs> you and I saw this in 2009. Do you remember this? I do. I was in hospital. Yeah, yeah. So there was a there was an outbreak of swine flu in Lviv, or at least that was what the story said. And people and and the politicians quickly got on the TV and talked this up as much as possible. And you know, people went mad. I mean, you know, the city was quarantined because we were both in Lviv at the time, and it's near Poland and Slovakia. So they closed the borders. They quarantined the entire city. No one could come in or go out. Uh, the streets were empty. Everyone was buying up masks from the chemist. Public transport was empty. Halloween was almost not celebrated. Do you remember we went out on Halloween and there was just nobody there? Yeah. Mm, yeah. This, this was the same time I was in hospital with pneumonia, uh, possible swine flu, wasn't it? Or are you talking about a different time? Yeah. Mm. No, I am. I am. But but you'd come out of hospital and, and we went out for Halloween. And Halloween is, by the way, usually very enthusiastically celebrated in Ukraine. Mm. Uh, but but this year, no, no one, almost no one. Uh, and and then I remember the, the spectacle of seeing Yulia Tymoshenko, who was the, the prime minister at the time, on the TV, like doing all of these, going all through all of these actions where she was saying to people that she was going to save the country from swine flu and she was like, you know, helping people who were going past on stretchers and stuff like this. And look, a couple of weeks later, most people had concluded that there really wasn't a swine flu outbreak because uh, the number of flu, flu cases was actually down that year from the previous year. And many people who'd reported the swine flu just had normal flu. Flu, but they were so panicked that they <laughs> that they um they reported it as swine flu. That's but true. At the time um, of the scare. Sometimes mm -hmm. the sometimes people can be led to believe there's an epidemic when actually if you look at the figures, I mean people were dying of pneumonia and swine flu at that time in Ukraine, and, and they published the figures. But actually, if you looked on the internet uh, for the normal figures uh, worldwide, it's quite it's quite shocking how many people do die of things like the flu. But it's it's fairly normal. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And in Ukraine, people die from flu every year. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's basically what happened. The government just leapt on this and went, this is going to be our way of showing the people that we're on their side because there was an election coming up in, early in the following year. Um, and and people just reacted in a way that seemed to us as foreigners to be way over the top until, you know, on later reflection, you think about your own society and what happens when a leader successfully pushes the terrorist threat button, same thing happens. Mm. People massively overreact, you know. This is different buttons for different people. Um, so anyway, <laughs> uh, moving on to horror movies. Um, <laughs> They're, a, they're another well-studied phenomenon. You know, there's, there's been loads of research into why people watch them because it, it seems a bit counterintuitive you know, that, that people would 
voluntarily submit themselves to an experience which is you know designed to make you feel bad uh, and if you if you look at these studies three separate motivations keep coming up one the first one is the experience of tension you know which which you could sort of compare to how some people are addicted to the adrenaline rush of you know extreme sports or amusement park rides or whatever um, the second one is relevance which sounds a bit odd but but it could be some kind of personal relevance if there's a theme in the movie that resonates with something in your own life uh, it could be something that's culturally meaningful but it could also be about the fear of death and of course that's you know relevant to everyone so people want to kind of go and, and, and watch death but but at the safe remove of you know I'm in the room and this is on a screen and we're not quiet together so I'm not going to die right um, so and then thirdly there's there's escapism right which are, all of those are I think fairly expected but I also came across an interesting theory uh, it's called the uh, gender socialization theory but it's it's popularly known as the snuggle theory of horror right mm -hmm. the snuggle theory goes like this it gives uh, one of the functions of horror movies is it gives young males and females the the opportunity to kind of cast themselves in a very traditional role for a short period of time and show another person how they are in that role so this was again based on a study that um, scientists uh, spent uh, uh, sorry researchers sent um, men into 36 men I think it was into cinemas to watch horror movies with women who'd been told to play three separate roles a very calm role a totally indifferent role and a scared clinging on to the guy for dear life kind of role right and the men most positively rated the dates who were scared and clinging on to them and going ah all the way through the movie they liked that yeah you know, mm -hmm. much more than the woman who would just go it's all right it's only a movie and then then they did the same thing with girls and they got they got the men to play three roles, and the and the girls liked the men who were totally in control and saying, "Don't worry, it's only a movie; everything will be okay." So so it seemed that seeing these movies together gave each partner a, an opportunity to 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 show the other one something about themselves. And it, as it turns out, it's something very traditional, if you could use that word, um, uh, you know, the male protector versus the kind of girly girl. Uh, so that's the snuggle theory of horror, but apparently your your horrid experience didn't quite work out that way, right? <laughs> well, no, it didn't. Maybe I wasn't comforting enough. <laughs> uh, basically, <laughs> we, we went to see Passion of the Christ, which isn't uh, isn't in the genre of being a horror movie, but it does have extremely gruesome scenes in it, and uh, it actually gave uh -huh. me a headache as well. Anyone who's, who's seen it probably knows what I'm talking about, but... Yeah, so it didn't really work on that occasion, but um, I think. Um, but you didn't get under the you didn't get under the chair, did you? Um, I may have I may have gone under the chair and started <laughs> so sobbing, which she may have not f have found it uh, too attractive. I don't know. <laughs> See, if you'd known about the snuggle theory of horror, everything would have been okay. <laughs> Damn it! See, we we don't just give people um sort of details about the news and what's happening in the world. We give dating advice here as well. We absolutely do. Anyway, so I believe you're. Um, I believe we're about to hear from Jeff. Yeah, we are. Um, we're going to go over and speak to Jeff Wise, um, and uh, who was recently on our um, episode 49, I believe, uh, about MH370, because he wrote a book about MH370 called The Plane That Wasn't There. He's also written a book uh, called Extreme Fear, and so we're going to go and uh, see if he's available at the moment. We're lucky to be joined by uh, Jeff Wise, author of Extreme Fear, The Science of Your Mind in Danger. Um, Jeff joined us recently on the MH370 episode. Um, he's also written for the I'll Try Anything column for Popular Mechanics and written for Time, Business Week, New York Times, Men's Health, Psychology Today, etc. Uh, in the pinnacle of his career, Jeff joined us recently, as I mentioned as well, on, on, on Truth Sentinel. Um, Jeff, welcome back to Truth Sentinel. It's good to have you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm having a double apex to my career now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How did you come to be writing about fear? Well, I was doing a lot of adventure travel um, in early in my career, and uh, I became interested in things like flying small airplanes and bungee jumping and as I was doing these things I noticed that my mentality entered a peculiar state you know when you're when you're on the top of that bungee bridge 
you almost feel like your mind is being possessed or taken over. You enter a sort of an altered psychological state. And I became very curious as to how that works, what's going on in my mind. When I feel like my mind is being taken over, what is taking it over? And so that led me to this psychological research that was that was really uh, entering a kind of a golden age at the time. So we actually know quite a bit about the the underlying physiological and psychological mechanisms. And uh, it, it turns out that, that this stuff can be quite useful, that the, that the fear system is an ancient one. It's a powerful system. Uh, it's somewhat at odds with the way we prefer to consciously and rationally carry out our actions. But by understanding the ways that it can, it can interfere with our conscious thought, we can somewhat reduce those effects. Yeah, would you say um, the negatives outweigh the positives when it comes to fear? I really wouldn't, actually. I mean, what I would say is that fear is a kind of a superpower. Uh, and like any kind of superpower, it can be uh, used for good or for evil. Um, it was designed to get us, our ancestors out of danger so that they would stay alive, so that they can ultimately, you know, produce us. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you're being chased by a tiger, um, the fear response allows your body to perform at normally superhuman capacities. You can run faster. You know, a lot of these performance-enhancing drugs that athletes take actually mimic the effects of the fear response. Uh, when people take stimulants, for instance, that, that mirrors uh, what, what adrenaline does for you. When people accuse me of being afraid, I can just say that's my superpower. <laughs> exactly. I'm embracing the superpower of fear. Great. Yeah, I mean, uh, me and Anthony were talking earlier about how people freeze in fearful mm -hmm. situations, and I think you mentioned in your book as well about how the um, the frontal cortex is it shuts down, and you, you sort of lose the ability to make complicated decisions. Right. Um, that seems to be not a very useful thing to happen in a fearful situation, though. Well, it it, it seems like that at first blush, but if you look at it a little more carefully, um, the frontal cortex is a system that is engaged. Mostly, you know, when you're in a peaceful, calm situation, which fortunately for modern humans is most of the time, and you can kind of sit there and ruminate and contemplate and think about all the things you could do and all the things you don't want to do, and you can win a game of chess and you can design a rocket to take you to the moon. But all these things are, are very slow and they take time. And if you're in a situation where, say, a safe is falling towards you from the top of a building or, you know, um, a lion is running at you, you don't have time to do that kind of thing. It's not a very productive avenue of approach. So what this sort of the, the, the more primitive part of your brain, the more basic part of your operating system recognizes this fact and shifts your brain's focus from rumination to action. And so this, the, the things that you don't have to ruminate and think about things that you can just do automatically. Now, so basically, if you haven't trained and you've never been in this kind of situation before, your options are pretty limited. You've just got running or fighting or freezing. And, you, and, and what we tend to call panic, which is often not the most useful thing to do, but it's all we've got. Um, if you've trained, like you're a soldier, imagine a special operations warrior who's got his, you know, special kit that he's going to use. Um, you know, you can fly a fighter jet while someone's trying to kill you. You can you know, operate a um, guided missile while you're on the ground fighting the enemy because you've trained to do it. And so it's all, all that complicated action is already encoded in your, your memory. And so you can call on that even when you're very much afraid. Yeah, and you looked into um, space studies of fearful situations. Would you be able to give us any examples of those? Yeah, one of the interesting ones I looked at was a woman who was um, out doing, she was a hydrologist, and she was out testing some water in a remote canyon out in the American West. And as she was doing this, she noticed that a mountain lion was a short distance away and looking at her. And, she, and so she crossed the stream that she was studying to get away from it very calmly, very rationally, but then the, but then the lion came after her. It crossed the stream. She crossed back, and they kind of did this dance back and forth. And... As the line became closer and closer, her, her fear response went through several levels of response, kind of starting with like condition green, going through condition orange, and then to condition red, and then condition black, when this thing was actually on her and she was fighting it 
Um, she, you know, and, and then, she, you know, the thing was overpowering her and it seemed helpless and she was actually underwater and she went into this freeze condition like the playing, like playing possum. And it was fascinating to me to really, to, in this single case, to see all the different ways that the fear response, which we tend to label um, as panic and tend to think of as just a dumb, counterproductive response, is actually a fairly sophisticated, gradated um, response to varying levels of threat. And so, so, so what we think of as dumb and counterproductive it actually can be quite useful. Jeff, you also jumped out of an aeroplane, I believe, with sensors strapped to you. What was the conclusion from the data on that particular exercise? Well, I worked with a researcher at uh, Stony Brook University on Long Island here in New York uh, State, and uh, she was basically trying to figure out why some people uh, respond well to intense fear, to intense danger, and other people do seem to panic or fold. And so it's hard to do a study of human beings under uh, extreme fear because, you know, there's ethical rules. You can't just, um, you know, pull a gun on someone. Uh, and so what she did was she had put up a notice at the local skydiving center saying, hey, if anybody hasn't uh, uh, skydived before and wants to try and, and, and also is willing to be part of an experiment, you know, give me a call. I think they would cover the cost of the skydive. So you get a free skydive in return for allowing yourself to be wired up and, blood samples taken and so forth. Um, so I heard about this and I was very excited because I wanted to experience the cutting edge of fear research firsthand. Um, and so I got wired up and jumped out of a plane and it was pretty terrifying um, as expected. And um, so and then I got to see my results. I guess I did pretty well. So she, as I was going up in the plane, she had me, um, there was an iPad and I was doing like a mental test to see how well I could cognitively function as as fear progressively shut down my frontal cortex and uh, um, and then she, she she has a theory that uh, her name is uh, Lily Mohika Parodi um, her theory was that the key is not to be able to suppress fear but to be able to allow fear to to increase your performance to, to use the superpower that I mentioned earlier um, but then when the fear or the when the threat has passed, for your system to come back down to baseline levels quickly. People who suffer from stress, who suffer the ill effects of stress, and stress can be a very damaging, very life-shortening phenomenon, as it, you know, um, give, you know, is a factor in heart disease and all sorts of things like that. Um, people who suffer the ill effects of stress uh, are people who remain, their, their bodies remain in a fight or flight kind of situation. They don't get back down to base level. And so, and so hormones like cortisol keep circulating through their bloodstream. Their body keeps readying itself for danger when there's no danger present. And that can be very uh, um, injurious to health. Yeah, I did, um, I did a skydive as well. And um, sometimes if you think about the situation, it seems a bit silly. Like, why jump out of an airplane? You know, um, there's, there's, there, is a small, there is a small chance that your parachute won't open or something. But it's the exhilaration that people um, enjoy. And uh, there's a lot of people addicted to these, this adrenaline rush um, in certain sports. Why do you think people enjoy fear then? Is it just the chemical? Well, you know, this fight or flight response, you know, what, what, what scientists would call physiological arousal. It's basically, um, you know, we have different modes as we go through the, our, our, the course of our, our lives. We ha our bodies are, are machines that have, to res that have to perform in very different kinds of settings. And so the body at a subconscious level is able to adjust its functioning so that it can be optimized for this kind of activity or that kind of activity. Um, you know, there's times when you want to sleep, when you want to eat, you want to digest, your body wants to conserve energy, you want to be able to ruminate and think creatively, um, you want to be at peace, essentially. But then there's times when you have to have, when you have to take action, when you have to run after a bus, or you have to um, catch that meal, um, if, it, if you're a hunter-gatherer, you have to chase after that deer. Or another kind of physiological arousal is sexual arousal. If you have to perform uh, the reproductive act, this requires your blood to race and your heart to pump and everything. And these are all kind of activities that require arousal, that require 
the sympathetic nervous system, as it's called, the part um, of, of your uh, nervous system that encourages you to or allows you to engage in vigorous physical activity. Um, these are things that uh, are often very pleasurable. And uh, so it's a really a fine line between things that are scary and things that are exciting. And you'll see oftentimes, if, like I'm sure maybe uh, you felt this when you, when you jumped out of the plane. It was very scary. It was very unpleasant. Probably a part of you was asking yourself, yourself, why the heck did I ever have this idea? This is terrible. I'd rather be anywhere else than standing in the doorway, uh, the open doorway of an airplane. But then a, a time came, and this was my experience at least, where you know, you're falling through the air, you realize that you're, uh, you know, you've reached terminal velocity, and it kind of feels like you're flying, and it's really neat. And you're like, this is amazing. I, I, I can't believe I waited my whole life to do this. This is fantastic. And your heart rate is still pounding. Your blood is still pumping through your veins, but you're experiencing it not as fear but as excitement. And gradually, the more you do it, the less it feels like fear and the more it feels like fun. It so was uh, it was fun until um, the parachute opened. That was quite a shock. Um, and then uh, <laughs> and then when it's st we started spiraling down quite fast, and I did feel a bit ill at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I fly small planes, which some people find really scary, and I find fun. And I'm very conscious when I take people up that their baseline is very different from mine. And I and, and unfortunately, there are pilots who take people up and don't it don't it doesn't occur to them that the person who's going up for the first time is not going to have that same baseline as them. And so they'll do loops and steep turns and steep descents that, frankly, are just unpleasant and terrifying for their passenger. And so those people never want to go up in a small plane again. And so when I go up, I have to take, I have to go fly around in a kind of a boring way for me because for the passenger, I want it to be fun and not terrifying. And I think that another case you looked at was a guy, a pilot who was doing aerobatics, and the wing fell off. I think, um, I think I've seen it. If it's the one that's on YouTube where that happens, and he lands it, it looks as cool as a cucumber. But apparently, he was pretty uh, scared when he was doing it. Yeah, I don't think this particular one was on YouTube because it happened back in like in the early 1970s, and it. He wasn't filming it or anything. Oh, okay, there's another one. There's another one then that's on YouTube of a guy doing aerobatics, and the wing comes off but he just yeah. manages to fly it down with one wing and then land it it looks pretty yeah, that's, amazing that's fake mm. it's physically impossible if you have a wing come off you're going to spiral in and there's nothing you can do about it that was part of an advertising campaign my dad who sends me all the all every fake viral thing that happens on the internet sent me that one too ah damn i was um, duped i'm usually pretty good at fuck, uh, uh, spotting the fakes yeah. um, um but, I mean, it might have been based on that case because it was very famous, especially in the U.K. The guy kind of uh, was, was, was a legend in British uh, aerobatic circles especially. And um, what happened was he, was he was practicing for the World Aerobatic Championship, and uh, he was doing an inverted uh, maneuver at um, – I'm sorry, it wasn't inverted. He, he was doing a recovery from a high-speed maneuver at low altitude, and he overstressed the wing strut, and it started to break, and the wing started to fold up. And he did something that was pretty smart, which is what he's, he, he realized that since flying right side up was making the wing come up, he would fly upside down and make the wing snap back into place. And so that's what he did. And if he hadn't come up with that idea, he would have been dead within probably five or six seconds because he was only 300 feet up at that point. Mm. Um, now, he was still left with some, with some other problems, like the fact that he was, he was upside down. He had to somehow figure out how to land the plane upside down. He also had only a few minutes of fuel because the plane only had a limited amount of um, – even though it was an aerobatic plane, it wasn't able to fly all day upside down. It had a certain uh, – small fuel tank that would let it run that way. So he basically had a whole bunch of problems, but he managed to keep his cool and solve them one by one. And he was terrified. He, he later wrote that his knees were shaking. Uh, he felt the full effects of fear, but he also was able to keep his wits and to fight back the fear and to kind of pull off a number uh, of incredible feats one after the other. It was kind of like a James Bond sequence. Um, and, and, and the plane was trashed and totaled, but he came to a rest. You know, he himself was unscathed. 
Uh, and so, so when I, when I heard this story, I thought, how did he do it? This is a central question. How can we, you know, to really to conquer conquering fear is really about how do I get into a situation of intense physical danger or mental danger even, and and keep control in such a way that I can not only just hang on, but can actually think creatively. Uh, and so basically the entire book is an attempt to answer that riddle of how can you, how can one hope to, to, to emulate this guy? Yeah, well, I, I sometimes play chess myself, and um, it's, it's there's usually a timer on the chess moves, and uh, sometimes the timer ticks down, and you've got like seven seconds to make a, a crucial move, and it, honestly then it's... it's um, it just becomes very difficult. You tend to make a very sudden, hurried move, which more than often in my case turns out to be a bad one. I don't know about you, but in situations like that, I often find myself overcome with this intense awareness. All I can think about is the fact that I can't think about it. Like I'm mm. saying to myself, oh, my gosh, don't be thinking this thought. Think about what you need to be solving. Focus on the problem. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching myself. And that's the thing that, that you often observe with people who are gripped uh, with an unproductive kind of fear, this sort of awareness of, oh, my God, I'm very afraid. And if you've ever been in a situation, you know, a very kind of low-key uh, example of performance being ruined by, by fear is when you go into a public urinal and you're standing there and there's a guy who's also getting ready to pee and you're just like, nothing's happening. You're like, oh, my God, nothing's happening. The more you think about the fact that nothing's <laughs> happening, the more it doesn't happen. You find yourself just very self-conscious, very awkward. And it doesn't really matter because eventually, you know, whatever, nature mm -hmm. will take its course. Um, but it's very frustrating. It's kind of the paradoxical nature of fear is that the more you're aware of it, the worse it gets. And so you're con we're very used to this idea that if we consciously approach our problems in a rational way, we can solve our problems. But in the case of fear, the reverse is often the case. Our thinking about and trying to solve our, solve our problems actually makes it worse. Yeah, indeed. Um, I mean, everyone, a lot of people have uh, different fears, and other people might find um, a person's fears irrational. Like I'm, I, I hate spiders, uh, big spiders. I don't mind the small ones, but someone else might sort of think that's that's silly because they're not going to, they're not, especially the ones that aren't dangerous. And you know, they might they might get a big spider and throw it at me or something. But it's absolutely terrifying for me. But other people don't understand other people's fears. Um, I mean, fear is kind of famously irrational. And I, my my personal view is that all fear is irrational, um, in the sense that the emotional response that we feel does not come from our frontal cortex, does not come from rational analysis. It's something we just feel at the level of emotion. And it might happen to coincide with a rational explanation. Um, for instance, when you were standing in the doorway, the open doorway of that airplane, as you quite rightly observed, there is a non-zero chance that your parachute will not open and you will crash uh, to an ugly death. Um, but that's not why you're feeling that fear. The reason you're feeling that fear is that at a very primal level, we are hardwired to not like precipitous drops. And so uh, at, at some very deep level, your brain is, is taking in this situation and saying, this is bad. Red, red alarm, you know, uh, flashing alarm lights. This is not good. We shouldn't be here. Um, and so, you know, rationality is a tricky thing once you start taking it apart. Um, there is, it is reasonable, you can make a reasonable argument for why something might be bad for you, um, but, but it's not that reasonable argument that's causing the fear. And uh, I noticed in your book you made a sort of um, a connection between people being afraid of, afraid of the wrong things sometimes. Um, I mean, sometimes this is uh, used to manipulate uh, people by the media, by governments, by business. Um, people are, for example, people are afraid of terrorism, but right. you know, statistically, people are more likely to be hit, hit by an asteroid than being killed by a terrorist, for example. Did you look into that a bit in your book? Well, you know, at the time I was writing the book, uh, it was uh, a time of intense. I mean, the, the, what you just said was 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 very much front of mind of, of myself and everyone. We were, we were uh, the United States, where I live, was 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 trying to collectively dig itself out of this horrible hole that we dug for ourselves by complete overreaction to a bad thing that happened. And just as someone might get you know 
um, bitten by a bee and then be terrified of bees for the rest of their life. We had something bad happen, uh, and we completely overreacted and, and really shot ourselves in the foot in many ways and continue to do so in many ways. Um, and this is, the, this is part of the danger of the fear response. It can run away. You can um, harness fear, as I've said, um, and you can also uh, succumb to fear. And, you know, I, I, if you think about the, 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 the mayhem that was facing Great Britain in 1939, they had every reason to be afraid. Lots of, I mean, and, and you know, actually suffered some horrible, horrible things with the bombing and, and of the blitz and everything. Um, and yet the response, uh, you know, Winston Churchill was, you know, to inspire courage uh, amongst the populace. And so to harness the fear and say, okay, we're, we're, this, this, this giant threat is looming. This existential crisis is upon us. We will pull together. We will work as one. We will deal with it. And, then there, and, and contrary-wise, you had a minimal or, or perhaps even non-existent threat facing the United States in the wake of 9-11, um, and yet the response was not to let's let's pull together. In fact, George Bush famously said, um, "Don't do anything. Don't go shopping." The, the, the response to this threat should be to go shopping, um, which is a, which is a terrible thing to advise people to do. We basically, you know, the uh, I, the two things that we have two main weapons uh, when we fight fear. Um, one is uh, to take action, to, to feel active, to feel that you are responding to the threat, to not feel passive. And the other is information, to know about the threat, to understand the nature of the danger. And so contrary-wise, the, the fear is most unbearable when we are passive and, and, and ignorant. And so basically this is what was the state that we were, that we were led into um, in which, you know, for instance, you'd go to the airport and it would say threat level yellow or orange or whatever it was. And they never explained what that meant or why they said why we had to be at threat level orange. So we were kept in the dark. Um, we were told to be afraid. We were told there was nothing we could do about it. Um, and it, it just caused a kind of a pandemonium, a social pandemonium. And, uh, and yet, it, in a sense, one could argue that it worked in the sense that George W. Bush was elected to second term uh, and it was, it, was, it was able to you know, prosecute this cat catastrophic war in Iraq. Um, and uh, and so yeah, all of this was very much front of mind. I didn't want to kind of veer off into that territory too much. I wanted to keep it practical and nonpartisan. Um, but yes, to answer your question. I am um, yeah. I often wonder what they mean when they sort of say be extra vigilant and they, this you know um, say a new status level uh, has has arisen in say the UK when they say the the, the terrorism level is higher. Like. Um, so it almost seems like they're saying, be more scared today, you know, and, and I just wondered like, how you're supposed to react to that. You're supposed to walk down the street and, and look left and right a bit more and just, or, or you know, just be, uh, look around and uh, be more fearful, really. Well, you know, this is, this is um, a great way to understand the difference between fear and anxiety. So when we're afraid, um, you know, if someone's banging on my door, I'm afraid of, whoever it is that's banging on my door. So I have a focused objective, and my response is narrow, it's temporary, it's specific. Anxiety is when you walk around on high alert, not really sure what you're on alert for. And fear can be useful. Anxiety, generally not. Um, you know, you're just, you're, you're just on edge, you can't sleep, you can't really eat, you you probably are having all kinds of other emotional and social dysfunctions. Um, as, as I said, anxiety is terrible. Long-term anxiety is terrible for your health. Um, and to promote it as, as a governmental policy uh, is, I, I think, equally unhealthful and unhelpful. And did you look into phobias at all? I did have a chapter on phobias. They're very interesting. I mean, phobias are kind of a bright spot for me because even though they cause people a lot of um, unpleasant emotional experience, they're, they're very amenable to treatment. So it's, it's fairly easy to treat phobias. Unfortunately, the kind of um, intuitive response that people have for phobias is exactly the wrong one. And so, it, so I do advise people to get professional help uh, if their phobias are intense. 
Um, but, you know, it's called extinction therapy, and it means kind of deliberately approaching your fear so that your kind of subconscious fear systems can learn to have an appropriate response. It's a bit like, and it's sort of psychologically analog- analogous to uh, um, to allergy, you know, where your body is physiologically responding to an irritant by overreacting. Um, and you, again, similarly, you can kind of get over allergies by kind of by exposing your body to small amounts so that your body can learn, oh, this is actually okay, I don't need to overreact to this. It's very true. I mean, I used to be very um, afraid of public speaking. I think that's a lot of people's fears. It's one of the highest fears, I think, that people have. Um, But I overcame that um, gradually. I mean, now I'm I'm a teacher, so, uh, you know, I have to do that on a regular basis. And, yeah, if you do something regularly, it tends to get easier. But sometimes confronting your fears, like, I, you know, for example, spiders, I know what the therapy is going to be for that. I'm afraid of the therapy. <laughs> the therapy is going to be spending a lot, a lot of time with those eight-legged creatures, and I, I'd rather not, you know. You kind of have to take a personal cost-benefit analysis um, and say to yourself, is, is my fear of, of spiders really holding me back? Um, you know, if you're a, if you're a um, curator at the Museum of Natural History, it might be a big problem. Um, but if you aren't, I, you know, you're, you're probably going to lead a full and happy life anyway. Um, but, you know, I, I say, that, uh, conversely, people who are fear, afraid of flying, that can really be a, a career ender. Um, so you do have to grapple with it. Um, but, you know, I kind of take the philosophy that I espouse in the book, which is that um, the, the, the lives that we lead are bounded by our fears. Um, if you're afraid of traveling, think of all the sites in the world you're not going to see. If you're afraid of, um, of, of animals, think of all the experiences you're not going to be able to have. And, um, you know, a lot of us uh, could, you know, the idea of going out into a crowd of strangers, we could take it or leave it. And, uh, you know, there might be nights when you think, eh, I, you know, I, I just don't. I've got butterflies in my stomach. I don't feel like going into this this social setting. And think think what could happen if you did overcome those butterflies. I mean, when I was a teenager, I was terrified of girls, um, and yet I forced myself, like we all do, I guess. Mm. You know, I, and thank God I did. And uh, and so I, I I guess I espouse the philosophy that in general, if you if there is something in your life that you feel anxious about or afraid of. I would say take a step toward it. Get in the habit of just taking a step toward it, not overwhelming yourself with anxiety or dread, but coming to, coming to recognize that what you fear today might thrill you tomorrow, might cause you excitement tomorrow. If you go around and, and look at people who speak professionally for a living or, or in some way get up on a stage or get in front of the public, I think you'll find that probably the majority of them at one point in their life felt terrified at the prospect of getting up in front of people. And yet at some point, by exposing themselves to the situation, what was terrifying became thrilling to them and became maybe one of the most enjoyable things in their lives. Yeah, I think um, I think every guy's experienced that fear of being, say, in a nightclub or a bar and seeing a girl they like, but just all these thoughts pop into people's heads like, you know, oh, what if she laughs at me? Um, uh, but sometimes, you know, you, it's never quite as bad as you think it, it's going to be, or if it is... Um, or if they do make fun of you, even that's not as bad as you might think. You can you can sort of enjoy those situations. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And um, you know, why I write in the book about a guy who was a one of the, the most co- uh, decorated combat veteran of World War II, and he like you know single handedly fought back a German armored column. But at home, they and so he was a hero, and so they took him home and they put him on a speaking circuit, going around the country to you know raise or money for war bonds or whatever and he was terrified of that he hated that he was like he couldn't cope um and i think it's kind of a great example of what a point that you raised earlier that people can be you know fearless in some situations and utterly terrified of other things that seem relatively harmless that's just the nature of fear we all have our own quirks and oddities but yeah i mean you you go to the bar you tell you, you know you tell yourself oh she'll probably blow me off she's too pretty i'm you know whatever and uh, that's the kind of self-talk that uh, can really be self-defeating and can really limit people. And that it's not just the bar situation, but there's, there's lots of things, you know, get, um, you know, trying for a job or, um, you know, maybe you tell yourself, well, if I had this, you know, this training, I could reach the next level uh, in my job. And but then maybe maybe uh, I'll fail. You know, fear of failure is 
is, I think, one of the number one things that holds people back from fully realizing their potential. Yeah, I agree. I think um, if people can sort of sometimes break out of their comfort zone, I think you mentioned this in a video that um, I saw online, then it can lead to some really interesting situations and a more fulfilled life. There's a book I read actually some years ago that some people may be familiar with called The Dice Man. Have you ever heard of that book at all? Uh, is it about Andrew Dice Clay? Dice, yeah, dice, uh, where you throw the dice, you have oh. six options. Um, oh, okay. No, I hadn't heard that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a fictional book, but it's kind of, you know, a lot of people used it as a way to change their lives. In fact, on the front cover, it says this book will change your life. Oh. Uh, written by Luke Reinhardt. And basically the idea is um, if there's some things you want to do in your life, but you've never really broke out of your comfort zone to do them, put them right. down as options. Um, put, put a couple of safe options down. And then decide, make the decision that you're going to obey the dice. Basically, you throw the dice, and then uh, you you can live you can live a whole week or even a year like that, and you, you'll find yourself in some very strange situations, but interesting ones. I love that idea. I love that idea. It's like kind of removing yourself from the process a bit, because what happens is, you know, this we, we it's so easy to be, engage in rationalization, to tell yourself, oh. Um, you know, oh, she, she's like you, you cited the bar example. You know, oh, oh look, she's she's probably gonna, um, you know, blow me off or laugh at me or or, or something. Um, and it, that that's why it's always so much easier to give advice to friends than it is to give advice to yourself because you can see much more clearly. Uh, you're not going to make rationalizations on behalf of a friend. You only, you know, that's a, something we reserve for ourselves. And so if you take take a step back and imagine yourself as somebody else and say, well, what could this person do? And you'll write it down and maybe, you know, ascribe it a number or some, assign it a number. Um, and then kind of as if you're, you're God rolling the dice and then this person uh, has to carry it out. I mean, if you can actually ca carry it out, that's probably the trick. Um, it's getting yourself to not then, once, you, once the die roll comes up, say, oh, forget it. <laughs> or re-roll or whatever it is. Human beings have an amazing capacity for, for self-delusion, you know. Um, but I think that's a wonderful idea. Just in general, you know, any, any trick or mechanism you can, you can find to kind of push yourself out there and to feel fear, recognize fear. Sometimes, as you said, you know, the, the most unpleasant thing about an experience is the fear that we feel. And whatever the bad outcome is, it's not really as bad as that horrible butterfly churning gut feeling that we experience. And so just tell yourself, you know, maybe say to yourself, you know what, I probably will fail. No. I'm going to walk up to this woman and I'm going to say something and she's going to say something and I'm going to feel like an idiot. But you know what, I'm going to do it anyway. And and then you've got nothing to lose. Absolutely. Um, can you remind us the name of your book again, um, where people can get it if they wish to read it? Um, it's called Extreme Fear, The Science of Your Mind in Danger. And uh, you can probably... Get it on Amazon, I guess, is a, is a good place as any. But uh, it's um, and you know, also I have a website, JeffWise.net, where um, I uh, sometimes post about psychology. Lately, as you know, I've I've been so, uh, focusing a lot on MH370 and other aviation disasters. Um, but uh, but people can reach me through that website. I wanted to thank you once again for being a great guest, and uh, you never need to be afraid of coming back to to join us at Truth Center. You're always welcome. Well, my, my pleasure. I, I'm, I'm always happy to come. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jeff. So thanks very much for listening to today's episode. Remember, don't worry too much about anything. Worry is a fairly uh, useless emotion. Uh, fear sometimes can help you, as we just discussed. Um, please check us out at www.truthsentinel.co.uk. Get in touch if you want to have a chat um, for you if, or if you want to come on the show. And uh, if you wondered where Anthony went there, he had to leave us halfway through that interview. Um, but he'll be back to join us soon, and we have another episode coming up soon uh, with L.A. Marzuli. Seth Davis will be joining us again. Uh, we've got lots of uh, upcoming episodes, so stick with us. And I hope you have a good week. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.